Now it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's lecture, Emma at Home, Lady Hamilton and Her Attitudes. And I'm delighted to introduce our noted speaker, John Wilton Neely. Professor Wilton Neely is a professor emeritus in the history of art at the University of Hull, a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries, fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. In addition to his long and distinguished academic career, he served as director of the Addingham Trust for the study of the British country home, as well as director of educational studies at Sotheby's in London. He's a well-known authority on European visual arts of the 18th and 19th centuries and a frequent writer and author on the subject. Since 1996, Professor Wilt Neely has been a visiting professor at the master's program at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum in New York, which is a unit of our Smithsonian Institution, a position that brings him frequently to the United States. As his latest trip has coincided with the bicentennial year of Nelson's Battle at Trafalgar, his lecture is certainly quite timely, especially so as Nelson had described Emma Hamilton as a legacy to my king and country. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, it's always a pleasure to be here at the Athenaeum. I regard this as one of the highlights of my tour, in a sense, for me personally, to be in a very distinguished and such a wonderfully emotive place as the Athenaeum. This evening I'm going to be talking about one of the great beauties of Western culture, and I say that quite advisedly because in the history of European art there have been iconic beauties who have been very often very closely related to great artists and in a way have become almost icons in their time. I won't go through a list, but obviously Simonetta Vespucci uh, is one of the great muses of Botticelli. She appears in The Birth of Venus and in many other works. One would think also of the Fornarina with Raphael, of course. And much more recently, people like um, Jean Shrimpton in the 60s with David Bailey, the great photographer of that period and so forth. These are women who launched a kind of style and they were in a sense, characteristic of their age. Tonight I'm going to pay tribute to Emma Hamilton, who in her own time was one of the most celebrated beauties of her era, celebrated by nearly all the major portrait painters of the period. But more than that, also a very remarkable person in another respect, and that is in a pioneering sense. She was one of the first people to develop performance art in a way that, of course, one's much more aware of Isadora Duncan and much more recent developments in dance and creative theatre. So the Portrait of Emma, really, tonight is about this very celebrated phenomenon of the attitudes, the attitudes which were so famous that they were actually engraved and became circulated throughout Europe. And some of the greatest connoisseurs of antiquity who came to Rome and to Naples, where she was with her husband, eventually Sir William Hamilton, spoke very warmly of her. Goethe, for instance, was by no means a person to throw bouquets around in a casual way, and he was very much impressed by Emma Hamilton. It is an interesting phenomenon, this, about Emma, that it's almost Pygmalion in reverse, because... I put a vase on the right-hand screen, a Sev vase of about 1780, which shows the famous legend of Pygmalion, where, in fact, the statue comes to life. But in a curious way, the story of Emma is quite the reverse. It is, in fact, um, the living person who becomes a work of art. And, in fact, Horace Walpole, slightly cattily, as you can imagine, with Horace Walpole's barbed wit, says in 1791, when Emma marries Sir Emil Hamilton, Sir William has actually married his gallery of statues. <laughs> well, let us now review the situation that Emma grew up in, because it's a very interesting phenomenon in a very much wider sense, as I hope to explain this evening. 
in the later 18th century, as everybody knows, there was this great shift in European culture, the Enlightenment, and the artistic equivalent, of course, was neoclassicism. When one tries to define neoclassicism, I think the best way of describing it is a new look at antiquity. But there's yet another sobriquet that one could use, and that is antiquity for the designer. Not only were people more aware that there was a variety in antiquity, but that antiquity was something that could serve contemporary art. And in fact, Robert Adam, who is a great practitioner of this use of antiquity, firmly believed that art should be brought into the service of modern design. Indeed, the Industrial Revolution came at the same time that promoted the Adam style, had such a powerful effect upon the federal style here in America. It's a subject of a book that I'm writing on at the moment, the diffusion of the Adam style. But one of the key people who were part of that movement of reassessment of antiquity, um, Winkelmann, the great German art historian who arrived in Rome in 1755 and became the librarian to Cardinal Alessandro Albani at Villa Albani, um, whose portrait appears on the left-hand screen by Mengs, um, published a series of absolutely landmark books. His first book, of course, in 1755, was The Imitation of Greek Art. I'm using the English translation, because in fact the Gedanken, as it's known for short, was translated very quickly after it was published. And this was very much to assert that one, to be great, one had to go to the ancients to create contemporary art. This was the theme of neoclassicism. Of course, it was a heady mixture because by this time, the Roman side of the equation, um, particularly fronted by Piranesi, were deeply challenged by this assertion that the Greeks were nobler, simpler, and much more fundamentally primitive in the uh, sense at the time of being first in the field in the visual arts. And so the Greco-Roman controversy spiced things up in the 1750s and 60s. But what is common to all of these movements in discovering new aspects of antiquity, as in Herculaneum and Pompeii, was a new understanding of antiquity for the present. And Winkelmann's belief in noble simplicity and sedate grandeur, which is the phrase that he used in the um, imitation of Greek art in 1755 is explained very much by the kind of illustrations in one of his later books, the Monumenti Inediti, which in other words is um, book, uh, works of art which had not been known before and he published in this collection. This is um, a, a, a Greek vase that you can see on the upper level of the engraving and part of the frieze around the Greek vase is shown in this deliberately austere, highly linear kind of world. Now, this is quite important when we come later to look at Emma Hamilton's career because, in fact, the idea of Grecian simplicity and the line was immensely important in the movement of the body. And it's one of the ingredients that we're going to find mixed up in this very complicated world of the attitudes. If we actually also take the story a bit further, in a way, there is this great change in the attitude towards drama and the conveying of dramatic art. So Joshua Reynolds, who was the founder president, as we know, of the Royal Academy in 1768, was a great believer that art, of portraiture particularly, should be more than just likeness. It should be a poetic act. And some of his lady sitters, not terribly enthusiastically, were shown sacrificing to the graces as Lady Sarah Bunbury here is on the right-hand screen. In other words, this idea was the timelessness of art going back to antiquity, but in a sense readdressing the needs of the present. Lady Sarah Bunbury, you can see, is sacrificing to the three graces. Mrs. Delaney, one of the catty ladies of the time, said that she never did sacrifice to the graces, but there she is. Anyway, um, now you can see her in Chicago, incidentally, in that rather wonderful work. Reynolds believed that portraiture was ennobled by reference to poetic and dramatic art, and so many of his uh, sitters were shown in these particular works. They were, of course, deliberately painted to be shown on the walls of the Royal Academy, because in every summer exhibition after 1770 onwards uh, was a great podium, so to speak, metaphorically, for Reynolds to put forward his idea of history painting being grafted on to portrait painting, ennobling and raising the quality of portraiture in that particular way. 
But it's particularly fascinating to find that Reynolds went to actresses, really, more for his idea of dramatization, because obviously they were gifted to portray ideas in a visual sense much more than the sedate aristocratic ladies like Larry Sarah Bunbury. And here we have two Reynolds portraits, one of the 70s and one of the 80s. Um, Kitty Fisher on the left was a particularly notorious lady. Um, she died, by the way, of cosmetic poisoning. She used a lot of white uh, lead on the pores of her skin and she came to an untimely death. But she was a very extravagant young woman and Reynolds very cleverly portrays this as Cleopatra, of course, dissolving the pearl in vinegar in front of Mark Antony's stupefied gaze. So there she was an expensive lady, but portrayed again through the power of antique art. And being an actress, Reynolds found a far more immediate sitter to convey this idea. Even more suggestively is uh, Mrs. Abingdon as Prue, uh, a part in one of the famous comedies of the period, leaning extremely unladylike on the back of a chair. Lady Sarah Bunbury would never have been seen looking that. But, of course, the way that she puts her finger in her mouth is a slightly erotic kind of element, too. It's quite a, a sort of suggestive portrait in lots of ways. And, in a way, this kind of use of the actress to convey these ideas of dramatic art is paralleling a revolution that is now taking place on the stage in Britain. Garrick's rather stilted acting, Garrick, of course, a great actor, but nevertheless, the change was taking place away from the whole litany of gestures according to the rule book of Le Brun and the images and so forth of the past, is moving now into the kind of real dr dramatization that you find in the 19th century onwards. And in a way, these women and the whole business of Emma Hamilton is part of this early pioneering movement towards a new, sty sty uh, new situation in dramatic art. Let's now look at the situation at a much higher level of Mrs. Siddons, because Mrs. Siddons, of course, was in, undoubtedly probably one of the greatest actresses Britain has ever produced. She sat to Reynolds in the 80s, and of course the original painting, which is now in the Huntington Gallery in uh, uh, California, shows her as the tragic muse. There's nothing flippant, there's nothing erotic about this. This is a very stern piece of painting. But again, it's interesting that here is Reynolds trying to put forward his poetic images on the strongest level, but again with histronic art, not actually only using gesture, which was the old-fashioned style of acting, but actually acting with the body. And this is extremely important when we come to look at the rise of Emma Hamilton. Emma, where did she come from? Came from very simple and very humble beginnings. She was born Amy Lyon in 1765, daughter of a blacksmith. Her birthplace survived enough to be photographed here on the right-hand screen. And I look at this very beautiful sketch by Romney, the artist who was so closely associated with her in her later life, uh, which gives the, um, the idea of this extremely beautiful young woman. Her rise was fairly meteoric in its way. Um, she was, in fact, a nursemaid at the age of 13, and then she becomes an artist's model in London in 1779. Of course, we don't really know whether these are images of Emma or not, but they're close enough to give the reality of her background at that particular point. She sat to Joseph Nollikins, a sculptor, whom you see on the left-hand screen, she was also actually um, taking part in a rather more dubious enterprise, Dr. Graham's famous Temple of Health at the Adelphi, the great block of terrace housing that Adam had recently built. Dr. Graham was one of those um, characters who appear frequently right through history, the, the quack. Um, you could go there for, uh, it's, I suppose, a kind of health hydro, really, in some ways. There was um, a bed of... Um, a celestial bed which had nymphs in attendance, and I don't need to dot, dot, dot about what went on there. But the whole thing was extremely dubious, but Emma apparently was part of the entourage of Dr. Graham's health-giving and life-giving force. <laughs> she then went from that stage to becoming a kept woman of one of these rather chinless wonders that Pompeo Batoni portrayed on the Grand Tour. Had a wonderful English name, it almost has to be invented, Sir Harry Featherstone Hoare. 
there he is on the left-hand screen by Batoni on his grand tour with the conventional dog. And the beautiful house that he lived in, many will know because it had a devastating fire not very long ago. And it's Upark, of course, a National Trust, beautiful house, which has been immaculately restored since that time. We don't know much about Emma's activities, except there is one particular story, which may be apocryphal, but it seems very much in character, that she was enticed to dance naked on the dining table for the gentleman after the port was served. Uh, but John can get some idea of the kind of life that Emma was leading. She was, of course, aged 18 by this time, and soon she passed on to a more elevated gentleman who was to be, in fact, the nephew of the Earl of Warwick. His name was Charles Greville. On the left-hand screen is this famous sophony of Charles Townley in his sculpture gallery in his house in Park Street in London, about 1780, and the young man in the slightly sort of brownish jacket behind the bust of Clytie, which was uh, Townley's favourite um, classical bust there, is the young man who looked after Emma. It was very convenient for Greville for the time when he was still looking for a rather wealthy wife, and it definitely was a love match at that time. But it was he who introduced Emma to her future artist, and that, of course, is George Romney. For something like about eight years, she sat to Romney in a variety of poses. And this is really where the acting comes into the story, because she was nearly always portrayed in some particular a role. Here she is in a very pensive kind of role. role. Um, they started the sitting in 1782 when she was uh, 17 and finished about 1786 when she was 21. But there's no question that Romney was the person who launched Emma and was really the celebrator of her beauty as the very opening image I showed you with that very lovely sketch that I put on the screen. To give you an idea of the range, and I apologise that we don't have colour slides for these, uh, the sketch on the left of Emma is at Medea, showing the rather sort of uh, histronic, rather tragic role that you see there on the left. And on the right, she's at Circe, the um, enchantress who changed people into animals. And here again, you see this kind of histronic art coming out more and more in this period. Of course, Reynolds had started the idea, and Romney really took the idea as far as he could, but there's no doubt that uh, Emma's very much his muse in this particular way. Reynolds, of course, did actually portray Emma in these years. On the left, again, is one of those slightly suggestive pictures by Sir Joshua, which make you realise there's a slightly naughty side to Sir Joshua as well as the rather more sedate side. And this is rather a winsome image on the left of Emma as a bacante. On the right is Romney showing her as uh, nature, with the bouncing dog and that kind of Diana feeling to the whole thing. By this time, of course, engravings were a way of portraying these famous portraits to a very wide audience. Of course, Reynolds took advantage enormously of engraved uh, images of his picture. Sometimes even the sitter's name was lost, and they just became personifications of some virtue or some situation. And here are a group of gentlemen by David Allen perusing the sort of engravings such as we're talking. On the right are the engravings of those two portraits I've just shown you. And you can see how, again, Emma's beauty was starting to be broadcast over a very wide area indeed through these engravings. Sir William Hamilton, um, who was the envoy extraordinary at the court of Naples, was the uncle of Charles Greville. He was a very distinguished man. I hardly need to introduce him to this audience because, of course, he's world famous for his collection of vases, in fact, two great collections of vases. Um, he was also an outstanding expert on volcanoes. He wrote, in fact, a treatise on volcanoes and studied, of course, um, the volcano Vesuvius nearby and so forth. Here we see him on the left by David Allen in his rather more important role as ambassador with the Order of the Bath or, um, regalia and so forth, a hint of his interest in antiquity with, of course, Vesuvius just in the background to the side of his um, right hand there. On the right, by Vincent Danon, you see him in his courtly position at 
the Neapolitan court. There he is with his um, retinue, um, in fact, talking and discussing uh, diplomatic business. Now, he comes into our story for the very fact that um, Greville was thinking of a way of unloading Emma on him. <laughs> the situation was that Greville realized that Emma, of course, had no money behind her. He needed a wealthy heiress, and near enough, a wealthy heiress came in sight. And so he persuaded Uncle to take Emma on a holiday back to Naples with a one-way ticket, so to speak. Uh, Emma, of course, had no idea uh, of this particular game plan, as we might call it nowadays, but there she is, um, arriving in Naples in this most exotic atmosphere. I put a rather lovely painting by Pietro Fabris on the left-hand screen to show you the view across the Bay of Naples with Vesuvius in the distance, and a Palazzo Sessa, which is um, uh, Hamilton's residence in the center of Naples, uh, had a magnificent view of this particular area. He was a great collector, as I've said, of vases, and although you're not looking at an interior as it used to be thought of his um, collection, we now think it's Lord Fort Rose's collection, it was very close in Naples to Hamilton, and it gives you a fair idea of how Hamilton would have spent his time. But Hamilton does actually appear in this particular work. It's one of two, by the way, two images showing the same room in two different directions. But the man here with the violin is Sir William Hamilton himself, and uh, he is, in fact, in the company with people who, like himself, were collecting antiquities avidly as they were being dug up. Of course, in those days, many of the vases that you see up on the shelving here, as indeed in Palazzo Sessa, were thought to be Etruscan vases because they were unaware that the Greek colonists had actually made such a complete inroad into southern Italy as they had done. It was only later that, of course, um, Hamilton began to realize that his vases were very often Greek rather than Etruscan. But there was this culture of collecting antiquities, particularly people who were at the fringe of the court. We must remember that the King of Naples, um, Ferdinand IV, was in fact in charge of the excavations. They were on his territory. He had the prime pickings of anything that came to the surface. And obviously he passed a great deal on to various members of the court, including the extraordinary ambassador, Sir William Hamilton. The vast collection of Hamilton was one of his consuming passions. As I've said, he had two collections altogether. The first collection he eventually sold to the British Museum, where it is one of the most important parts of the British Museum's collection today. The second collection he started collecting all over again, because being an inveterate collector, having completed one particular cycle, he wanted to start all over again. It was the, it was the sense of the chase, the pursuit. And I might mention, by the way, in a parenthesis, that Susan Sontag's excellent novel, The Volcano Lovers, which is about, in fact, this whole entourage of Hamilton and Emma later on, is making a very interesting point that Hamilton was a collector, and he collected this very beautiful young woman, as well as the works of art round. On the right here, we see Hamilton um, here in this very typical, very distinguished position in an antiquarian shop in Naples. He's obviously looking around for new acquisitions for his collection. He was one of those omnivorous collections, rather like Sir John Soane, his great contemporary. But Hamilton was a very disinterested collector in another way, uh, in the sense that he wanted his collections to inform and help artists. And this again comes into the story of Emma to a considerable degree, because when he published his collection in four volumes in the 1770s, um, and I'm showing you the open page of one of the most beautiful uh, antiquarian books of the whole 18th century of any country, the vases were deliberately uh, developed along these longitudinal rectangular sort of margins. In other words, the frieze was opened out in a rectangle so that they could be used by artists. And in fact, already, even before they were published, um, Hamilton was in correspondence with Josiah Wedgwood in Retruria, the new name given to Wedgwood's factory on this misunderstanding about the vases. And here you see on the right-hand screen the, por the portion of a portrait by Reynolds of the Society of Dilettanti in London receiving William Hamilton into their midst as a very distinguished member in the 1770s. And you can see one of the volumes open with the vase concerned uh, on the table in front of the gentleman. I might mention, by the way, just simply because we are on a rather loose subject occasionally this evening, uh, that this gentleman is holding a lady's garter. 
Um, even the most astute iconographers have still not been able to find out what that garter is doing in the middle of the society of, uh, of dilettanti. <laughs> Anybody who can supply a footnote to this, I'd be most delighted to know about it. William Hamilton had married um, a very attractive and a very musical woman, uh, Margaret Barlow, who died very tragically at an early age in the 1780s, in fact in 1782. Emma had actually arrived in Naples um, a few years later. So, in fact, Sir William had this problem of having a very beautiful young woman uh, landed on him. Um, and, of course, it was a very difficult position because Emma was in no position to be presented at court in that way. I'm showing you David Allen's portrait of the first Lady Hamilton. Um, I'm sorry I haven't both in colour, but you can see her playing an early square uh, pianoforte, in fact, and uh, she was an outstanding ambassadress, there's no doubt, but a very tragic early death left Sir William Hamilton um, destitute. Coming back to London to actually um, attend to her, her, her funeral, she was buried in Pembrokeshire actually, he met um, Romney, he sat for a portrait, actually we're seeing a portrait not by Romney on the left-hand screen of Hamilton, but of Edward, um, Edward Douglas uh, Hume's portrait. But he met Romney and, of course, the young lady who had been very much the centre of Romney's programme. And here you see Emma as the spinstress in this particular role. Yes, yet another dramatic sort of episode in Emma's life. Well, as I've said already, Greville was keen that Emma should go back with Sir William to Naples. And so she arrived in Naples with her mother on the left-hand screen there as a kind of chaperone. And she remained there very much within the circuit of the Palazzo and the various villas that Hamilton had round the Bay of Naples. This rather lovely painting by Pietro Fabris on the right-hand screen it actually shows the view from William Hamilton's Palazzo. And in the distance across the a bay towards uh, Posilipo was another villa um, on the outskirts where they went frequently in the hot weather. It was known as Villa Emma eventually. There it is on the right hand screen, another view of this very beautiful ambience. Emma took to this life very quickly. She was a very skilled learner in terms of language. She got fluent Italian, fluent French. She began to be groomed gradually by Hamilton. And of course, the main thing was that for Hamilton, she had become something very special. She was almost a personification of the beauty of classic art. We find this particular situation in a contemporary account um, where somebody describes how, in fact, she took to proposing for William Hamilton in the form of the old masters. For instance, I put a Raphael on the left, St. Catherine of Alexandria from the National Gallery, which originally belonged to William Beckford. And on the right here, one of those um, sort of Guido Reni, Raphael-esque kind of poses of Emma as a muse of poetry um, and was engraved, of course, and widely disseminated. This is, by the way, by Gavin Hamilton, one of the leading neoclassical artists in Rome at that particular time. Emma, having arrived in Naples, was very lovesick because she was deeply in love with Greville and she had no idea of the game plan, as I've said, and here she is actually giving us an impression of her early years in Naples. She said, I respect Sir William. I have a great regard for him as an uncle and a friend of you, and, and he loves me, Greville, but he can never be anything nearer to me than your uncle and my sincere friend. He can never be my lover. You do not know how good Sir William is to me. He is doing everything he can to make me happy. As he has never dined out since I came here, he sups and is constantly by me, looking in my face. I can't stir a hand, a leg, or a foot, but what he is making is graceful and fine. So here again, she was the object of adulation of this much older man. It was a fascinating and rather complex relationship. But now the story becomes more complex. Goethe, who visited the Hamilton uh, entourage in the 80s, left a very interesting account of something he found in the palace there. He says, Sir William Hamilton, who resides here as ambassador from England, has at length, after his long love of art and long study, discovered the most perfect of nature and art in a beautiful woman. She lives with him, an English woman of about 20 years old. She is very handsome and of a beautiful figure. The old knight has made for her a Greek costume, which becomes her extremely. 
Dressed in this and letting her hair loose and taking a couple of shawls, she exhibits every position, variety of posture, expression and look, so that here in perfection, in movement and in ravishing variety, all that the greatest artists have rejoined to be able to produce. Standing, sitting, kneeling, lying down, grave or sad, playful, exulting, resplendent, wanton, menacing, anxious, all mental states follow rapidly one after the other. With wonderful taste, she suits the folding of a veil to each expression, and with the same handkerchief makes every kind of headdress. The old knight holds the light for her and enters into the exhibition with all his soul. He thinks he can discern a resemblance to all the most famous antiques, all the beautiful profiles on the Sicilian coinage, eye of the Apollo Belvedere itself. This much at any rate is certain. The entertainment is unique. We spent two evenings on it with thorough enjoyment. Well, this, of course, is the attitudes. Um, we have, unfortunately, no um, descriptions of the attitudes in the detail that we should like to be able to reconstruct it. I've often had a kind of dream plan one day to recreate the attitudes. We have an ambience in England in a house uh, near Wimbledon, which was um, a place where Emma um, performed the attitudes. We actually have the very venue where many of them were performed in England. But, of course, the most important place was in Hamilton's Palazzo in, Ven in, in, in Naples. Um, Novelli, one of the uh, artists who visited the household, in fact, has given us uh, these series of dry point sketches of Emma in action. They do give us something of the kinetic uh, pattern, because in fact the attitudes were not just mime in single frames, as it were, like stills from a, a, a cinematograph, but they were in actual fact flowing from one into the other in a series of gestures, and it was very much to a cultivated audience. An audience like yourselves who would actually recognize the classical sculpture, the references to Guido Reni or to Raphael or to objects from antique vases. This was all done in total silence, but with a supreme skill of acting that we have in testimony from a variety of different observers. So this is really how we have to piece together the story of the attitudes. They started out... Hamilton originally had the idea of a kind of lined box. Uh, it was a kind of upright box of velvet in which Emma actually took various postures in coloured drapes and so forth, but that, of course, cramped her style as an acting actress. And, in fact, the attitudes as we know them today were, in fact, done in front of an audience in a room with only the props of shawls and occasionally the odd vase. You can see one there, for instance. And this was essentially something to appeal to the connoisseur in those who watched. The way that Emma's face worked was very important as much as her body. And here we have, in fact, Tischbein, who was one of the great artists of the period who worked and lived with Goethe and portrayed Goethe in a number of uh, paintings, describing Emma's face. He said, the face of Lady Hamilton remained always beautiful as it was. Yet with the slightest movement, say of her upper lip, she was able to express contempt, which made her beauty fade away. I have painted the face of Iphigenia as faithfully as possible from hers without taking away anything or adding to it. As I was painting, Lord Hamilton came in and gave her a letter announcing the death of a friend. She was so taken by pain and grief that she burst into violent movements, but in sorrow, crying with her arms over her head, falling and lamenting over her friend, then over herself, all the attitudes she took for a painter were well, well worth seeing. So one can see that not only to the connoisseurs of the circle of Hamilton and the visiting people, but also to the artists of the world, Emma was an absolute gift. It wasn't long, of course, before Emma's um, attitudes were engraved. In fact, Richard Wendorf edited a facsimile edition in, Emma, in, in memory of Eleanor Garvey um, some years ago, and um, these wonderful plates of Reberg. Um, show us Emma, as it were, in frozen postures. And I'm going to use them to show you some of the different guises, which, of course, were rapidly succeeded one after the other. So we're just looking at, it were, frozen stills from a, almost a, a cinema performance here. Reberg, typically in the, Winkel, in the Winkelmann world, 
freezes the image not only, but also produces it in the classic line of Grecian simplicity, very much in that particular manner. It's very important to stress. This idea of very tonal kind of engraving was going out at this time, and it's very interesting, when Hamilton produced his second set of vases collection, he got Tischbein to engrave them, and they were all, in fact, in line. They weren't in the rich colors that I've shown the first collection when they were eventually published. If we look at the um, view of Emma seated in a Christmas chair, this is particularly classic chair with the sabre leg that you find in Greek and Roman um, reliefs and paintings. I'm putting one of vases from Hamilton's collection on the right-hand screen, showing you the kind of source material that Emma produced. There's no question, of course, that Hamilton was very much the mentor in this. This was very much um, a duet, really, in many ways, because not only did Hamilton hold the, var, hold the light and, as it were, introduce his wife, but he also prompted her with all sorts of ideas for all these postures. Um, very recently, Lorianne Touchette, a very distinguished archaeologist, has actually looked at Emma from the classicist's point of view and has come up with a theory, which I think is a very convincing one, that actually Hamilton, who is a very learned scholar, was trying to recreate Roman pantomime. Now, of course, pantomime in the ancient world was not the burlesque that we understand with pantomime today. It was, in fact, simply mime. But it was a very serious art form. And in a way, Hamilton was trying to recreate an ancient Roman practice of drama in these particular um, works. Here she is, for instance, uh, seated very much in the posture of one of the very famous wall paintings that had been extracted from the excavations in Herculaneum. It's now in the Museo Nazionale in Venice. But uh, it also, of course, by the way, had a very strong impact on a very much later artist, and that is Ang. Anybody who knows Madame Mottessier in the National Gallery in London will know that Ang, in fact, took this famous pose of uh, this uh, figure with the, uh, with the head leaning on the fingers and the arms from this particular fresco. So this fresco was very much a seminal work for Emma and for many people in the Hamilton Circle and artists later on. Here, for instance, um, we see her with one of the reclining positions, which was famous at the time. Um, I put the Ariadne from the Vatican, not that I'm suggesting this is a direct quotation by Emma of the Ariadne, but this is one of the very famous reclining figures, sometimes known as the Cleopatra, a very much a Grand Tour icon and engraved, as you see it here, for grand, the Grand Tour circuit. But you see Emma there with the vase. One of the interesting uh, episodes in the circle of the Hamiltons is when the English ladies arrived and were not quite so complimentary about Emma. There was a certain amount of cattiness, in other words. We have to remember, of course, that Emma spoke broad Cumbrian in her English, and that was a very, very broad dialect indeed. Uh, she spoke perfect Italian, and to the Italians in general, they had no idea, in fact, what her speech betrayed in terms of her fellow countrywoman. And, in fact, Lady Holland, who was a rather snobbish lady, in fact, um, uh, actually made note of an occasion when Lady Hamilton was lying down in the pose of a water nymph, rather as you see there, with her head resting on one of Sir William Hamilton's Greek vases. And uh, according to Lady, Ham uh, Lady uh, Holland, um, Emma supposed to have said, don't you be afeard, Sir Willem, I'll not break your jug. <laughs> well, hardly the most elegant thing for a nymph. But then, of course, as I say, <laughs> this was an occasion where she was a little worried about this wonderful artifact being uh, at some sort of risk in that particular case. The most extensive commentaries on Emma come from a young Yorkshire squire called um, Morritt. John Morritt came to Naples in 1791, um, and here he is um, actually writing home to his mother about uh, seeing the attitudes for the first time. It's one of the most valuable commentaries we have on this occasion. You may suppose her really an extraordinary woman, without education, without friends, and without manners, when she came here. But she has added to all the outward accomplishments of a woman of education, a knowledge of Italian, French, and music, which last, with a very fine voice, she executes divinely. Add to these the most difficult of all, the ton of society which she has raised herself to, and through the most elegant, she is certainly on a par with most women of the circle she is in.
This would be alone a proof of her very superior sense, but her conduct to Sir William Hamilton is a stronger one. As he does nothing but admire her and make other people admire her from morning till night, as, she would a fi as, he, as he would a fine painting, it is a delicate point, and yet she manages it so well that without affectation, without prudery, which would only make people recollect how times have altered, she keeps him and everyone else in order and behaves in the most exceptional manner. Moritz's testimony is one of these most valuable ways of getting some idea of the actual way that the attitudes took place. I think that in many ways the attitudes were a complex blend really of dramatic art and gesture and movement and expression. And there's no doubt that one of the most outstanding ways that Emma conveyed this was through this way of finding almost an empathy with literature. I think it's something very much to find with artists like Raphael, who were provided with programs by learned uh, divines and then found a kind of visual equivalent in many ways to this. Here she is as Nierbe, and, and in fact um, I've put again one of the exemplars of this famous female who was struck by the bow of Apollo with her children for offending the gods, and this is how, in fact, Emma achieves this particular way. I want to quote for a moment from Moritz, if I can find this quotation, uh, where he, in fact, refers to this, particularly in passing. It's a very remarkable series. Thank you very much. Thank you. Her toilet is merely a white chemise gown, some shawls and the finest hair in the world flowing loose over her shoulders. These set off a tall, beautiful figure and a face that varies forever and is always lovely. Thus accoutred with the assistance of one or two Etruscan vases in an urn, she takes almost every attitude of the finest antique figures successively, and varying in movement the folds of her shawl, the flow of her hair and her wonderful countenance is at once a sibyl, then a fury, a Niobe, a, so a, so a Sophonisba, drinking poison, a Bacante, drinking wine, dancing and playing the tambourine, an Agrippina at the tomb of Germanicus, and every different attitude of almost every different passion. You'll be more astonished when I tell you that the change of attitude and countenance from one to another, sometimes totally opposite, is the work of a moment, and that this wonderful variety is always delicately elegant and entirely studied from the antique designs of vases and the figures of Herculaneum or the first pictures of Guido. She sometimes does above 200, one after the other, and acting from the impulse of the moment scarce ever does them twice the same. In short, suppose Raphael's figures and the ancient statues, all flesh and blood, she would, if she please, rival them all. What is still better is that she acts with the greatest delicacy and represents nothing that but what a, the modest, most modest woman may see with pleasure. It is extraordinary, too, that when not acting, her manners and air are noble, and the moment she pleases, her whole figure is elegance itself. Here she is now in a more um, active mood, and it's clearly based on the famous figures known as the dancing figures from the Villa of Cicero. Just outside Herculaneum was a villa which was attributed to Cicero rather casually because they had to find sort of names to give to villas. And these little tiny works, because they're no bigger than about six inches high, you can see them in the Museo Nazionale today, were engraved in the Antiquita d'Arcolano, which was a, uh, a multi-volume work that started in 1757 onwards, published by the King of Naples to show the scavi, the excavation results. And you can see her here dancing in a very lively way. But this is deliberately um, chosen by me because it leads me on to another aspect of the attitudes which is rather more vigorous, and that is the tarantella. The tarantella was, of course, the famous uh, dance of the Neapolitans, particularly the folk dancing. You can see it here on the right-hand screen. On the left is, in fact, uh, two images by the same artist, William Locke, of Emma, showing her dancing, the tarantella. Here again, we come back to Moritz in 1796. We passed the day very happily as we dined there afterwards and in the evening had music and a new piece of acting in the character of Nina. With her hair about her ears, or rather her ankles, 
she sang a beautiful scene of Pinello, where she is supposed to be mad for the absence of her lover, and acted till she made us shudder and cry. A quarter of an hour after, in the dress of a Neapolitan paysan, she danced the tarantella with castagnettes and sang vaudevilles till she convinced us all that acting was a joke to her talents. And I assure you, I never saw in my life any actress half her equal, either in elegance or variety. A painter who was at the morning party when she performed her attitudes cried with pleasure the whole time. Well, this is one, as I say, of many descriptions which give us this idea of this series of mood changes and remarkable repertoire. Um, here, again, are two more artists feeding on the skill of Emma. I suppose one of the most famous women painters of the 18th century is Madame Vigée de Brun. And she paints Emma as a bacante there with uh, a Vesuvius rather ominously smoking in the background there. I suppose a tribute to William in some ways. And here, William Douglas Holm, whose portrait of um, uh, Hamilton I showed you earlier, um, shows Emma in the attitude of three of the dramatic muses. Here again, it's worth uh, quoting the work of another, the, the, the comments of another um, leading visitor to uh, Italy, at this, uh, to, to, to Naples at this time. And this was a member of the very distinguished Venetian aristocratic family, the Rezzonicos. The Rexonicos were, in fact, um, the members related to the Pope of um, the 1760s, um, Carlo Rezzonico. They were very important and very influential people. And here again, um, we have Conte della Torre di Rezzonico uh, explaining how he came across Emma for the first time. He said, I observe with great delight that just as the Greeks learnt to preserve the beauty of their females' faces, even when expressing tears or pain, Equally, this new Campaspi, when adopting an attitude of pain, never lost her beauty, and even when occasionally opening her eyes round in fright, did not seem to act, but imitated to perfection, now the Medusa of Rodonini and of Strozzi, now the Marys at the sepulchre of Anibale Caracci. He goes on to say later in his diary, she single-handedly created a living gallery of statues and paintings. I've never seen anything more fluid and graceful, more sublime and heroic. This English Aspasia knew very well how to assume every part. Thus, at one moment, I was admiring in the constancy of Sophonisba in taking the cup of poison, at another, the desperation of Gabriella de Vergi on discovering the heart of a warrior lover still beating in the fatal vase. Afterwards, changing countenance at a stroke, she fled like the Virgilian Galatea, who wishes to be seen among the willows after she's thrown down the apple to the shepherd. Or else she cast herself down like that drunken Pacante, extending an arm to a lewd satyr. Again, it's really mind-blowing the range and expression that we find in these accounts. The range of Emma was, of course, magnificent. But, of course, it had to be a very private affair because she wasn't married. But, eventually, Hamilton decided he had to bring her into society and they married in 1791, and she became an ambassadress for the first time. And you have a Romney portrait painted in London when they went back for Sir William on one of his regular visits to London. Here she is on the right. Not looking quite so happy in this rather staid kind of position, but then she had a new role to play. They were married in St. Marylebone Church on the 6th of September, and that's actually when Walpole Cassily said hey, that he'd, uh, uh, William had actually married his gallery of statues. Well, they returned to Naples, and the attitudes continued, meanwhile, but of course now to a very much wider audience, since she was received at court. It didn't take her very long to get very closely in friendship with Maria Carolina, the Queen. Ferdinand IV was very much a hunting man. He had very much little time for the cultural life of the period, and he was happiest going duck shooting in the marshes. But Carolina was really the one who ruled Naples at that particular time. And Emma, who had, of course, by this time, fluent Italian as well, became really quite an influential figure at court. The English government, who started to hear about her, got rather alarmed that she was having too much influence on the Queen. Now, we have to remember that the Queen was actually the sister of Marie Antoinette. 
and things were starting to hot up very much in the 1790s. So in other words, the court at Naples was in fact a particularly dangerous area for somebody who was a slightly loose cannon, so to speak, in the diplomatic circles as Emma has now become. Hamilton, meanwhile, carried on his antique collecting, and here we see Emma in the frontispiece to his book on the volcanoes. There she is in a very much Gainsborough-like hat with throwing drapery, present with Sir William when they're discovering a tomb. This, by the way, is one of the Tischbein engravings to the second collection of vases which Hamilton had engraved before he then set about trying to sell the collection yet again the second time round. Here again, I think one notices the way that taste is changing to this much greater linear Winkelmann kind of abstraction in the sense of the flowing Grecian line. I think you'll realize by the appearance of Lord Nelson that life is going to change quite dramatically within a matter of years of the marriage because in 1793 there was in fact the presence of the French in Italy. And indeed, the risk, indeed, of the French invading the southern part of Italy was getting all the more violent all the time. In 1793, Marie Antoinette, of course, was guillotined. The Queen was beside herself with anxiety and remorse. And in fact, it was Emma who helped to evacuate the royal family to Sicily, for which, in fact, she was eventually um, granted um, a special um, award, which we'll see later. But, of course, the hero of the story is Lord Nelson, because when the French eventually invaded Naples, Nelson was responsible for flushing them out again. He'd come back, the hero of the Battle of the Nile in 1798, a handsome man and very much a man that Emma fell in love with. And so this tempestuous relationship now started. This relationship, this ménage à toi, is a complicated story. But it's quite evident until Hamilton died in, uh, uh, in uh, 1801 that he was very tolerant and, in fact, in a curious way, very honoured by this relationship between Emma and, and, uh, and Nelson. Certainly, this ménage à toi was causing a great deal of talk back in London. George III and Queen Charlotte were extremely anxious anxious, if not in fact angry, at this particular goings-on in Naples. And although it's true that Hamilton was nearing the end of his diplomatic career, uh, they were eventually summoned back to, uh, to London. While I've been talking, I've put a portrait, in fact, of the royal family, whom Emma served so loyally, actually, during the revolutionary period in Naples, Ferdinand IV and uh, Maria Carolina. Well, the arrival back in England of this strange um, menage à toi was a complicated issue. They couldn't be received at court. The king had no desire to see Hamilton with Emma and Nelson together. But of course Nelson's a huge hero, probably one of the greatest naval heroes of all time. He was lioness everywhere they went. But there was one event in Emma's life in England with Hamilton and Nelson which was a very distinguished and a fascinating one. It happened in the period of Christmas in this very strange building on the screen that many of you will recognize as Font Hill Abbey. William Beckford, a multimillionaire, sugar plantation father who had brought his son a huge wealth uh, when um, uh, the elder um, Beckford died in 1760, William Hamilton um, was invited with Emma and Nelson to this new plaything that Beckford had created called Font Hill Abbey. In 1800, the Abbey had virtually reached the point you see it in the engraving on the left-hand screen. It was undoubtedly the largest Gothic revival building ever built of any time. It didn't survive, as many will know. It crashed to the ground in the 1820s. But it was a house which had a kind of a choral sanitaire around it because Beckford had been accused of homosexual practices uh, nothing was proven, but he went to ground, as it were, in his great estate at Font Hill um, after his twenties, and therefore he was uh, definitely not persona grata at court. So therefore, in a way, he attracted other people who had a similar situation. 
And I think that the famous festa that was held in Christmas 1800 at Fonts Hill, it's the only social event of great importance ever that took place at Fonts Hill, was something which can be explained by this strange development of the relationship between Emma and Nelson. In this particular event, uh, Emma was invited to portray the attitudes. If I just go back for a moment, um, she portrayed the attitudes in this Gothic setting. And it was a rather strange one, because of course most of her repertoire was essentially classical. But she chose on this occasion one of her attitudes, rather than the entire range, because one has to bear in mind that she was pregnant. And being pregnant, she had to have flowing draperies, because she was about to give birth to Horatia. And so she betrayed um, the figure of Agri Agrippina, the uh, wife of, Ag uh, of Germanicus. And it's just worth re reading, the uh, reading the Gentleman's Magazine account of this particular event. Uh, it was published later in 1801 by Thomas Tresham, who was a painter who worked for Beckford in the Circle. Lady Hamilton appeared in the character of Agrippina, bearing the ashes of Germanicus in a golden urn, as she presented them before the Roman people with the design of exciting them to avenge the death of her husband, who, having been declared joint emperor by Tiberius, fell a victim to his envy and is supposed to have been poisoned by his order at the head of his forces, which he was leading against the rebellious Armenians. Now, I put the Benjamin West portrait uh, pa painting of uh, Agrippina and Germanicus because this is actually painted later and is undoubtedly influenced by Emma Hamilton's attitudes. In fact, very interestingly, West was present on this occasion because he was working for Beckford, producing a series of uh, paintings of the apocalypse for Fontiel Abbey. And so, therefore, there's a very direct connection, again, with, Adam, with, with Emma imitating art and then, if you like, art imitating Emma. It's a very fascinating sort of, um, uh, sort of uh, tripartite arrangement here. So I continue in Tresham's uh, account. Lady Hamilton displayed with truth and energy every gesture, attitude and expression that could be conceived in Agrippina herself, best calculated to have moved the passions of the Romans on behalf of their famous general. The action of her head, of her hands and arms in the various positions of the urn, in her manner of presenting it before the Romans, or of holding it up to the gods in the act of supplication, was most classically graceful. Every change of dress, principally of the head, to suit the different situations in which she successfully presented herself, was performed instantaneously with the most perfect ease, and without retiring or scarcely turning aside a moment from the spectators. In the last scene of this most beautiful piece of pantomime, again notice the antique use of that word, in this beautiful piece of pantomime, she appeared with a, 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 lady, a young lady of the company who was to impersonate a daughter. Her action in this part was natural and just, and so pathetically addressed to the spectators as to draw tears from several of the company. It may be questioned whether this scene, without theatrical assistance of other characters and appropriate circumstances, could possibly be rep represented with more effect. Well, of course, I put the Rayburg on the screen, which is not really literally the case, but it's near enough to give you a flavour of that attitude. I think you can realise what the gutter press was making of all this at the time. On the left is a crookshank um, on the, the relationship. You've got Nelson over on the right there with Lady Hamilton. Sir William in the brown there, and the Lord Mayor of London. It's called, in fact, a mansion house treat. Um, the actual commentaries in the bubbles are really quite fascinating, and uh, it's quite worth just mentioning what's going on. Um, in fact, in the case of Emma, uh, we find uh, Nelson saying, Foh, the old man's pipe's always out, but yours burns with vigour. Sorry, Emma's saying that to Nelson, I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> and Emma's reply, as you have in these consequences, is, uh, yes, yes, I'll, I'll give you, uh, sorry, uh, Nelson says, yes, yes, I'll give you such a smoke, I'll, I'll pour a whole bre uh, broadside into you. <laughs> Life was very coarse in those days. We often say that the gutter press today is, in fact, rather scurrilous, but I don't think you can really equal what went on in those days. Um, here, in fact, Gilray on the right-hand screen is showing Sir William as the collector, 
and making fun of all the vases, the very suggestive shapes to them. Uh, and also, of course, Nelson up there with uh, Emma as uh, Anthony and Cleopatra, of course. Um, and, of course, Vesuvius inevitably comes up <laughs> with, again, highly suggestive significance, as you can imagine. I don't need to enlarge on that particular matter very much. <laughs> Horatia was eventually born, and uh, Sir William Hamilton, who died in um, 1801, left behind a very glowing testimony to Nelson and to Emma. There was never any estrangement between them. Uh, Nelson and Emma settled into a house called Merton, just outside London, um, and in fact they had a fairly blissful time, but unfortunately for, as a turn of events took place, a very short time indeed, because within a matter of a year, um, we find, in fact, uh, Nelson being a called away on service, which was ultimately to lead to the Battle of Trafalgar. Hamilton left behind to Nelson these two portraits of Emma with a very glowing testimony. And it's quite important, I think, to stress this, that right throughout this relationship, um, Hamilton always had the deepest regard for Nelson in this particular way. The portrait cameo on the left-hand screen is by Vincent Denon, and on the right is a small replica by Henry Bone on enamel of Emma as a Bacante, painted originally by Vigée Lebrun. These were in Nelson's possession in his last years, in fact. And then, of course, there was the Battle of Trafalgar. Lef, um, uh, Els, uh, um, Nelson left for Trafalgar, leaving Emma behind with Horatia to go into action. And we have this very moving last letter that Nelson writes only three days before his death at Trafalgar. It's written on the victory in October uh, the 19th, 1805, 200 years ago. Um, on the left is the portrait um, by um, a German writer, uh, a German artist, Schmidt, of Emma wearing the Maltese cross that she'd been awarded by the Tsar of Russia for her services to the royal family in Naples when she helped them evacuate Sicily during the French occupation. This is the most cherished object that Nelson possessed, and he had it um, in his cabin uh, before he went on deck for the fatal event that you see on the right-hand screen. While he was looking at the portrait of Emma before he went on deck, two, two uh, days before the final event, he wrote this letter. And I want to finish with this. This is a very remarkable tribute. He said, My dearest, beloved Emma, the dear friend of my bosom, the signal has been made that the enemy's combined fleet are coming out of port. We have very little wind, so that I have no hopes of seeing them before tomorrow. May the God of battles crown my endeavours with success at all events. I will take care that my name shall ever be most dear to you and Horatia, both of whom I love as much as my own life. And as my last writing before the battle will be to you, so I hope in God that I shall live to finish my letter after the battle. May heaven bless you. Praise your Nelson and Bronte. He, of course, Duke of Bronte. Thank you very much. I'm told that uh, it's the custom occasionally to have questions. If anybody feels they would like to ask any questions, I'm opening myself <laughs> to this. Anybody? Yes? Could you describe Emma's life after the death of Yes, this is, um, one might say, a lecturer's decision to end on Trafalgar because of the anniversary this year. Um, but... I would, in fact, have gone on to say that uh, Emma died in penury. The codicil on Nelson's will, uh, written on the board Trafalgar when he was clear that he was li unlikely to survive that battle, not long after he wrote that letter I've just read part of to you, the codicil was to ask the government of England to look after Emma, a legacy indeed, as uh, my introducer mentioned. But the government totally ignored 
this particular requirement. Um, and in fact, the unkindest cut of all was a Horatia turned against her mother. She became a stalwart Victorian upright lady, was very embarrassed by her mother's adventures, so to speak, and so Emma eventually ended her life in Dieppe, in penury, and died in a pauper's death. So it's a very tragic story, really. It has to be said that Emma was not promiscuous. I mean, she was very loyal. I mean, she was loyal to Greville. She was treated shamefully by Greville, as you gathered from that letter. That uh, he, Well, in fact, I didn't read the whole letter, but she was quite clearly in love with Greville when she described arriving and finding this elderly man who was more of an uncle to her than any other and could never be a lover. She was certainly loyal to Greville until she was deeply, deeply wounded by the way she had been deserted. And she was very loyal to Hamilton, but of course the age difference of some 40 years made it very difficult for any kind of relationship other than a, 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 a platonic one. And so, of course, Nelson eventually provided that sexual relationship that uh, fulfilled her. But there's no question that uh, she didn't have that dissolute background that, of course, George III and Charlotte's court would have seen her at a distance because, of course, licentious rumours spread around. So I think the background to your question really is that the end of Emma's tragic um, fate was partly the misunderstandings at the time, the whole farrago of satires. I haven't shown you an iota of the images of Emma, which were very cruel by Gilray and other people. Reberg's engravings, for instance, uh, of the attitudes were terribly and brutally exaggerated and caricatured. It is true to say that Emma was rather plump in her later years, but you find Gilray showing her as um, uh, Ariadne um, mourning the departure of uh, Aeneas in the distance, with obviously a reference to Nelson going off to sea and leaving Ariadne behind, or, or Emma and so forth. So it is a very sad story that uh, Emma comes, uh, the, the end comes there. I have to say in parenthesis there is another sadness, of course, and that is the treatment of Lady Nelson, because she was very loyal to her husband. Uh, it was not, in fact, a glowing story, even though it's a very wonderful, attractive love match which spawned a number of films on Emma and, uh, and, and Nelson. But there are, of course, rather darker sides to this relationship, which are very uh, much one has to bear in mind. Thank you for that question. Yes. ever saw I, sorry, Derry Garrick, David Garrick. Derry Garrick. Um, it is possible yes it is possible the question by the way was did Emma actually see Garrick in action because the mobility of his features yes that would be remarkable so yes. people wondered felt that his face had actually rather fallen yes from yes his, yes from overuse by the end of his life that's right and Yes. He probably didn't. I mean, he didn't know them. Well, that's true, but... Uh, but he, 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 he made yes. quite a contrast. And here is a story about a Garrett attitude, yes. which is that on one occasion, because he didn't trust his French, he did the whole, is this a dagger that I see before me, yes. speech. Yes. He has a mind. Right. He was greatly moved in yes. the audience of French actors. Well, yes, yes. Yes, thank you. I think in, in, you're right that in a way Garrick is a transitional figure because some years ago um, one of my colleagues at the University of Nottingham, Alistair Smart, wrote a very interesting article about the, um, Garrick as Richard III on the night of Bosworth. And the gesture there of Richard III is certainly conforming to Lebrun's range of gestures. So Garrick was certainly schooled in the traditional uh, gestures, you know, of horror, of surprise, of delight, and so forth, with the arm movements. But you're, you're absolutely right that Garrick's wonderful face, his mobility, was notorious. Every portrait painter who painted Garrick had a difficulty. I know of a work in the Royal Collection of Garrick, um, it's by Hogarth, in fact, um, of Garrick and his, uh, his French wife, where the eyes are very strange, 
And it's only later that I learnt, in fact, that Hogarth had actually swiped his brush across the eyes. He was so furious because he just couldn't register Garrick's mobility of features. They were always moving. His face was always moving. And a number of other artists, Gainsborough is another, who commented on Garrick as an extremely difficult person to portray because he was constantly in movement. His features, as you rightly say, his face was celebrated for that. So I would qualify what I said earlier in the sense that it isn't a dramatic change, literally dramatic change, from the style of the gestural um, acting to, should we say, the more physical and the miming, as you rightly say, Garrick is a, a, a person who is in that transitional stage. But I think that Emma is belonging to a, a tradition that goes right up to Irving and the great dramatists of the 19th century, where there is much more histronic um, psychological drama going on, on the body language, as we would say today, which I think is a fact. But thank you very much for that qualification. I think that's a very important point. Thank you, yes. White powder. Yes. And I, I was wondering what was in that powder. Lead. 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 Yes, yes. It, it was in fact a common problem of, of, of cosmetics. But the Kitty Fisher was notoriously inclined to paint her face and uh, she just literally choked up all the pores. With, and of course the lead went in as well. So it was, it was a combination of lead and um, the fact that the, the pores couldn't breathe. It's a combination. At least this is what one understands, the death of Kitty Fisher. There's another lovely, by the way, um, painting. I've forgotten the artist for the moment. Richard Wendorf will remind me. It might even be Reynolds, but there's a, a bowl with a fish in it. Daniel Hone. And that's, of course, making, and of course there's a cat, you know, the predatory cat, and Kitty and Fisher, and so on. That, there's another, I mean, she was obviously um, a suitable girl for clever sort of parody pictures and so on, playing on her name, Kitty Fisher. <laughs> yes? Uh, sir, in, right at the beginning of your talk, you made a reference to similar to the persecution. Yes. Well, I was really making the point that every now and again there's a a famous beauty who sets a kind of uh, iconic status of appearance. You could say Jacqueline Kennedy was one of these. One might say Diana, Princess of Wales was another. One could go on a list of beauties who set a kind of pattern in female beauty and, as it were, style. And I think in the case of Simonetta Vespucci, it's generally accepted that Botticelli regarded her as something of a muse. Um, there's a lot of Simonetta look-alikes amongst the Botticelli Madonnas, for instance, and, of course, the birth of Venus, the Primavera, and so forth. So in uh, late sort of 15th century Florence, Simonetta Vespucci, who died, by the way, at a very early age, um, was a very famous uh, icon, as it were, a, a beauty icon, in the way that the Galatea of, uh, of, of Raphael is based almost certainly on the Fornarina, and indeed many of the Madonnas were of Raphael as well. So you, you find very much, very much a very beautiful woman who sets a kind of pattern of beauty for an age. And very often, if it's a great artist connected with that beauty, as Romney and, and Emma were, or great photographers and, and beautiful models, for instance, you get that kind of dissemination of an image over a large number of uh, cases of portraits and, and, and fashion and so forth. Is that, does that help? Yes, I the reason I was interested was because it's not as well known as the uh, Venus rising from the sea of the Primavera, but I believe there is a, a third panel. Uh, which, uh, uh, yes, there is, that's right. Venus, that's, that's in fact um, Venus, the centaur. Uh, sorry, Minerva and the centaur. And that's the third of the three panels done for the, uh, the Medici family. Uh, the, the three of them were originally together at uh, Castello, I think it was. And um, yes, that, that also has similar facial features to uh, see Miletta Vespucci as well. That's yeah, right. Because I was interested. That's not as well known as the other. No, it isn't, but it, it's, it shows how the image it transfers right across a whole cycle of paintings in May. Yes. Yes. Yes, I, I think that's very possible. I, I, I think she, she really went to pieces after this. As you can well imagine, after all, she'd been, after all, looked so well after by Hamilton and then by Nelson 
in that very short time they had together. And then, you know, the hero of Trafalgar, you know, and all the lionization of Nelson, and uh, she's just discarded. It's all forgotten, as it were. And uh, I think, yes, she, she took to drink, as they say, uh, in that very sad end to her. And it must have been a tragic thing to find her daughter turning against her as well, the unkindest cut of all in many ways. I'll take one more question, if there is one, and then I think we should finish, because everybody's probably gasping for a drink since we've just... <laughs> Since we've been talking about that subject. <laughs> Have I any other questions? No, well, thank you very much for the interpretation. <laughs>